I don't believe in autobiographies. Yeah. They're full of nothing but quote unquote capital L, capital I, capital E, and capital S. <laughs> so it's my first night in Freetown. Um, I'm incredibly tired. I've been up since 3.30 this morning and it's now past midnight, so... Um, but it's actually... I'm really, really excited to be here. November the 25th, 1888. Here we are at last. This country is clothed with luxuriant vegetation and strikes you from a distance as being bright green. If Sierra Leone is the white man's grave, it is certainly a whited sepulchre, very fair to look upon outside. However, before long I shall have plenty of opportunity of seeing whether there is anything particularly foul within the fair exterior. That's what my great-grandfather, A.K. Slesser, wrote on first seeing Sierra Leone. He was a junior army officer in his mid-twenties. I found his diaries as a teenager in the house in the country where I was born and spent my childhood. They still had his blotting paper in them with the ghosts of his handwriting. What I read disturbed me and made me ashamed of my connection to him. If my limited experience of the Negro, I've known him for seven weeks now, was sufficient to form an opinion by, I should have no hesitation in declaring him a very inferior animal to the white man, born to be a slave, as Plato says. My mother tried to reassure me that these were typical views for a man of his time and so excusable but for the last 40 years I've argued with him in my head. I wanted to go to Africa to carry on the argument. On the plane I was kind of thinking, oh God, I'm gonna be on my own for two weeks. I don't know what, I don't know. Don't want it. But at the moment that we kind of landed and I got a sense of the place and how exciting and how friendly the people are and... We disembarked at 4.30 when it was getting a little cooler. We fell in upon a flat piece of ground near the landing place and marched off up the hill at the most killing speed. Never in my life got so hot as when we reached the top, fingers all wrinkled as if one had been an hour in a very hot bath. And the heat, the heat is fantastic, it's like wet, wet, humid heat. Um, after London, December London, it's just amazing. I found AK's diaries in the room behind these windows. My mother had inherited the house from him. This is my sister and I more than 50 years ago, and again with our grandmother, and playing leapfrog in the garden, and then both of us leaving for boarding school at the beginning of a new term. The house quiet now without the sound of her practicing the piano. I made my first film at boarding school. to join the Boy Scouts, so the film was a kind of protest against the scouting movement founded by Baden-Powell, who, like AK, was a soldier in Africa in the 1800s. I play a Boy Scout on a camping trip who befriends a sheep. To cut a long story short, I neglect my scouting duties and we go for a walk. 
While I take a nap by a railway line, the sheep grazes on the tracks and is run down by a train. I haul the corpse back to the camp. So it's now um, quarter to midnight on my second night in Sierra Leone. It's been really mind-blowing from sort of getting up this morning and opening the curtains on a whole new world, which is always an amazing thing about travelling, like suddenly discovering yourself in a completely different place. Tower Hill Barracks was up at six and went to the balconies to inspect the place. I've never looked out upon so lovely a spot anywhere. Both sides of the barracks, the view is glorious. In front of you, you have the town stretched out at your feet, a large straggling conglomeration, chiefly of wooden shanties, with vast coconut palms, mangoes and all sorts of beautiful trees towering up amongst them. The ground slopes away gently from all sides of the barracks. In fact, as a strategical position, it could not have been better chosen. Not a man could come up it alive under a good musketry fire from above. Being driven around today is like there was nowhere really which looked not poor, or even the rich areas looked like they had poor people around them. Clothes very rapidly get destroyed here. I'm going to send all my respectable garments home. Black clothes and dress suits only get ruined and are quite useless. I'm glad though that I brought an old top hat out. Even in the town it's worth something, and a little way up country you can get a pocket full of gold bracelets and things for it. Within a few weeks of arriving in Freetown, A.K. visited the cathedral. He wrote, It's not a cheerful place to examine. The two main characteristics of the inscriptions are abuse of the climate and gratitude expressed by natives of Sierra Leone towards British officials who have died there. Five of the tablets were to officers of our own regiments. The way in which the climate here is slanged is almost amusing. One inscription was bitter in its disgust on the tablet put up to some officer who survived the Battle of Waterloo and perished in this unhealthy climate. Finding the stones that he, that I know that he's his own eyes, his eyes, he was physically there with those stones. He was there, I'm here. The, there is a, an, a solid kind of physical connection, you know, which isn't just fanciful. I've just had a day that's felt difficult. Um, Going back to the photo shop where I had my um, identity card photos taken and um, I had this really amazing great experience the first time I went there it was a f with friendly guys and, and the, they were messing about and it was felt really good and so I had this idea about going back there and photographing them, photographing me. Then going back, it's like 
a whole different thing and it felt couldn't find the same guy again and um, found these two guys who were nice but it was there was a sort of slight but I guess because I had the camera then as well there was a slight feeling of discomfort We don't want you to film here, please. Why not? We don't need you. We don't want you to film here. Forgot about them, and I'm going to put you on the job. Who are you? Who are you? My complacency was challenged, really. There were people, you know, who didn't want me there with my camera, even though they were all there with their cameras. But staying complacent in Africa didn't seem to be a problem for Victorians like my great-grandfather. I started to envy his self-assurance. Had a great day last Sunday up the river in the governor's steam cutter. Started at 9.30 to go and look at an island about 15 miles up the river, which, considering where it is, contains perhaps the most wonderful ruins I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> this is Tajani Barr, the producer I work with in Sierra Leone. It was his first trip to Bunce Island too. Strange and stirring events must have taken place on this Bunce Island, enough to constitute a history of deep interest. Right opposite us was a strip of sandy beach ending off on our right in long mud flats and abruptly terminated at the other end by a heap of rocks tumbling out into the water, which on close inspection turned out to be the remains of an old stone pier. On one side of it lay an old iron gun half buried in the sand. I dare say many others are completely and nearly eaten through with rust. We discovered a narrow overgrown track and following it up suddenly found ourselves in front of a lofty archway, the gates of which had long disappeared. This led up into a sort of large courtyard surrounded with walls and buildings whilst on our left, facing the river, was a battery of, I think, 13 large guns protected by a wall of brick nearly five feet thick. As I filmed, I noticed that the monogram of England's King George III was on each cannon. The wonderful ruins, A.K. writes about, are what's left of a slave trading post run by a series of British companies for 150 years. About 50,000 Africans were transported from here until the abolition of the slave trade in the early 1800s. What strikes you as much as anything else about Bunce Island is the lavish use of brickwork. There must have been shiploads of bricks imported from England. Imagine the expense of it all. Slave dealing must have been a remarkably lucrative business. He was right about that. The bricks were exported from England in the slave ships as ballast, to be replaced by human bodies on their way across the Atlantic, a trade which ended only 80 years or so before AK saw this place. The local guide showed us where some of the slaves were imprisoned. See this, no food. Oh, sure. uh, when they bring them, they oh, I'm not going to the captain. Yeah. If you see, it's a cave. Yes. Yeah. They kept them there for three days without no food. food. Mm -hmm. Monk four days, yeah. good to exercise. Four days, they take you for exercise. So, it's, it's a cave. Yeah. Imagine somebody kept here three days without food. No food. Tajani translated the guide's explanation of how the slavers built new dungeons to reduce the numbers who died before they could get them on board ship. 
So that's why they decided to build this big one. Uh, keep them alive. So to keep them alive. Yeah, money. because if you they find out that when they went there yeah. with them, yeah. uh, you kept somebody underground for for a long time. Yeah. And before before even you reach to your destination, the person is hopeless. Yeah. So they doesn't make money. That's why they decide to build the other the other structure there, which is bigger, and they kept them alive. This is where they eat. But AK focused on those who ran the island. It's a frightful idea to imagine English officers eating their hearts out and rotting on that deadly spot. Sierra Leone in those days must have deserved its name of the white man's grave. Another puzzle, where on earth did they get their water from? They may have had large open tanks to catch the rainwater, but no visible traces of anything of the sort remained. You can't keep somebody in a place without water. No, that's, that's what what one, that was one of the things my great grandfather said in his diaries was he couldn't see any wells, so he was he he must have missed this. Yeah, he missed this because this he hardly noticed this one. Yeah. You go close, you will see that it's a well because see how big it is. You see, wow. this is a well in water. I was really enjoying the feeling that we'd scored a point over AK. Yeah, no, he missed that. Yeah, he missed it. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have you to tell him where to look, you yeah, see. Well, he... <laughs> In 1787, whilst this island was still a slave trading post, a plan was hatched by a group of British philanthropists to settle hundreds of London's poor black people and former slaves in Sierra Leone. The story goes that on reaching Africa, they gathered under this cotton tree, now in the centre of Freetown. Just down the street is the National Museum with a picture commemorating the event. Disease and hostility from the indigenous people almost eliminated the first group of colonists, but in the next few years they were joined by other groups of freed slaves and established a colony here. Sierra Leone was the first non-white, non-European, non-British colony, settler colony. Uh -huh. We were the only genuine settler colony. Mm -hmm. Came out as settlers remained as settlers, and as we have a way of saying, when we have our little argument, born a settler, live a settler, and I will die a settler, so help me go. Edward Blyden is from a well-known West African family. In front of City Hall, burnt out in the recent war, there's a statue of his grandfather, also called Edward Wilmot Blyden, a prominent political figure who'd started the first newspaper in Sierra Leone four years before AK arrived in Freetown. Who's, is, it, is the, your grandfather the one in the middle? That's it, that's the famous Edward Wilmot by the grace of God, not this one talking to you now. Yes, that's the famous Edward Wilmot. Then you'll see a photograph of my grandmother from Liberia, who was Blyden's lifelong, quote unquote, paramour. Because when the Englishman, when the white man, the Englishman begins to find names for everything else that is foreign to him, that's when the word paramour. Uh, my grandmother was supposed to be Blyden's paramour, and I, and I used deliberately to needle. And my beloved mother looking at me as I talk. He has this real sense of his own family going back. Um, really for as long as, as I'm tracing my family back to A.K. Slessor, in fact, so that... Uh, and that made me think, made me kind of... as well, it kind of embarrassed by the, the comments that, that A.K. Slessor in his diaries makes about Creole people and that kind of superiority. These niggers crowd to church and even attend communion in considerable numbers, but they live like animals most of the week. The nigger seems utterly lacking in comprehension of the most elementary principles of morality. I don't believe he has the intellect to grasp any idea that does not immediately appeal to his senses. 
So do you think, what do you think the, the contribution, if any, to, of the British to Sierra Leone has been, or has it been damaging more? No, 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 it's been a massive contribution. I said that to begin with. Mm, uh, did, yeah. Oh, it's a massive contribution, I think. Mm. God bless the name of Her Late Majesty Queen Victoria, who was uh, an unusual person of her own kind. Thank you, thank mm. you, son. You are the ones now still studying. Mm. Queen Victoria the great-grandmother of your present queen. That woman was a, 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 a creation of her own kind. Yes. What do you mean? What? In what way? What, what do you think was remarkable? In about? terms of relationships with, quote-unquote, I would say, other people, because I'm thinking of us now. Uh -huh. I mean, she was the queen of England. And practically, she was like the goddess from Pr Pluto. <laughs> oh, yes. Mm. What's my agenda here? There's something weird about it, something like to do with me working out stuff about my own background. In some way, what I'm looking for here in Sierra Leone is for people to say, you know, your class is evil, they are bastards, they're imperialist, racist scum, or, you know, we hate them. And that that's in some way reflecting my own hatred of my own class in some way, which I guess is sort of stuff in the end about my mum or me and my mum, and it feels like, um, you know, it feels like really kind of, uh, well, it sort of feels like aged, 53, I should be kind of moving on from that, really. My relationship with my mother was close but troubled. I was devoted to her as a child, but often felt she was critical and remote, and so I learnt to be silent and withdrawn in response. The house evoked these feelings when I returned for this film. In the dining room where her portrait used to hang, eyes following you around the room. And upstairs, first on the left, where I had my bedroom. As a child, I used to have a recurring lucid dream in which I made myself fly down this staircase. Outside my bedroom, there was a long corridor to my parents' room. It always seemed too great a distance for me to go for comfort in the night, a feeling I've explored in psychotherapy. Can she hear you? Can she? I don't... I don't think so, no. Call her. <laughs> Mommy! I feel better now, 20 years older, and more understanding of my mother an anxious young woman who'd lost both her parents when she was still in her teens and now had babies and a big house to look after. She thought it was her duty to send me off to boarding school, to take up the white man's burden, as Kipling encouraged Victorian mothers to do, to bind me to exile in the service of empire. But I like to think of her now as a younger teenager before bitterness entered her life. I've just woke up from this very strange dream uh, of um was talking to a guy uh, a sort of working class guy in London and he'd just driven past my mum's 
grave and he said there was incredible floral tributes on the grave lots of flowers there and he said it also it smelt of diesel everywhere uh, with the implication that there, all the flowers were presents from lorry drivers Sunday morning, January the 4th, Rockell. Had a very successful journey yesterday and did it comfortably and easily in eight and a half hours. Rockell is a very large and flourishing place, just about 50 miles by water from Sierra Leone. And these big chiefs often run down the river to the town for trading purposes. So they are more or less familiar with the white man and his language. I began my visit to Rockhill by filming a meeting with the elders who told me about the Sasei family. Long ago, the story went, they'd been made the local chiefs because they'd driven all the alligators from the river. When they completely won the battle, by driving the alligators from this place, they decided now to pay them, give them land. The Sasei family were chiefs in AK's day too. The chief of Rockell, Alimani Sase, was a very old man and had resigned most of his functions to his son Koba, who played the host. The, the elders took me to meet Koba's brother's great grandson. Oh, well, my great grandfather was here, and here he was born. Uh -huh. In Rockell. In Rockell. Here was a very important area. Therefore, your grandfather found five houses here of the 18th century. I see. But these houses have been destroyed. Only one that we have now, yeah, that is the Bamba area. All the houses were of mud with thatched roofs, but very much better built and finished than anything I've seen elsewhere. The walls were straight and square-cornered, and the surface of them as smooth as brick and plaster, and all the timbers and poles of the roofs beautifully even and regular. Cooking and other domestic duties are conducted at the back. On the following morning, I thought I'd try the river in spite of horrified protests about alligators and alarming stories of how one had collared a child there only three days before. I took the precaution of having a servant with a loaded rifle standing on the bank all the time, did not swim out any distance and still had a most enjoyable bathe. When I came out, Cobber observed, alligator fear white man too much. If there is life after death, your grandfather will be very happy <laughs> to see your tracks treading on the area where he once travelled for so long, over a hundred, over a century ago. Mm. So we are happy to receive you and we welcome you wholeheartedly. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you. Mr. 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 Tony. You and your group, the elders, they said they have nothing here. We are just from the war. Mm, sure. But we thank God now we have peace. The entire community, the elders, the entire community, the youth, the women, they are presenting this mm, as a token. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very honored and very grateful to have received this. Thank you. There's something about retracing my great-grandfather's steps that, that, that has a kind of resonance for them, that they sort of understand that their kind of reverence for family and the generational links is more than ours, I guess. Certainly more than my own. Making this film is the first time that I wanted to connect with my mother's family. 
This is A.K. ten years or so after his time in Sierra Leone with his young sons. Members of my family I spoke to had only distant memories of him as a much older man. Uh, there's a, a fairly thin uh, album about halfway along the second shelf. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, this is it, you find it. Um, now, uh, yes, this, this is the wedding photograph of my parents, and I think that Uncle Arthur is that figure there. Do you see? It, it, it's such a small head that you could yeah. hardly make anything out of it. He was a rather formidable, in a way, rather irascible figure. Uh, not that he was ever cross with me, that I remember. Mm. Yes, I mean, I think one was tended to be slightly frightened of him. Mm. Which, which, which wasn't at all necessary, but you know, small children. Um, yeah, right. yeah. You, you knew you had to behave when he was around. Well, there was this one occasion I was staying down at Hollygrove when he sort of took me by the hand and showed me around the garden. <laughs> and he was taking me around the flower beds. So I say, now that's a, a tulip or that's something else. You know, <laughs> it's a daffodil. <laughs> What about the time when you and I were on the mat for not knowing? For not knowing, <laughs> for not knowing the Lord's Prayer. When we were eight, oh, right. I, was, I must have been seven and John was five and a half. And we were sent for uh, to his study. Mm. And we had to stand strictly to attention behind his, the other side of his desk while he asked us, A, why we didn't know the Lord's Prayer, and B, would we learn it there and then? <laughs> so we had to, by the time we left the room, we had to be able to. Say it by heart. <laughs> I can well believe that he was he was a, a disciplinarian. I think one certainly would say he was a, 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 a very much of a regular army type. I think but not completely relaxed, you know. Mm. I think one would say sort of stiff uh, upper lip kind of. They're all oh, yes, more than that. So, yeah. Oh yeah. But uh, I think I was sort of. Um, Slightly frightened of him as well, I'm mm. saying. Yeah. In awe yeah. of him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the word. Mm. That's the word. Just after I'd eaten, kind of went outside and heard the uh, this brass band, rather ropey old brass band, starting playing carols which was really <laughs> bizarre in the kind of hot and humid Sierra Leone night, wafting over the breeze and looking at all the Christmas lights in the garden here at the hotel. This makes the third successive Christmas I've had the pleasure of spending on the coast. Hard to imagine that this is the season one has hitherto associated with holly, carols, plum pudding and turkeys, robins in the snow and the rest of it. In the bush, 60 miles from a white man and probably shan't see a white face again till the relief comes up. I embarked last Saturday evening after having dined at mess for the last time before plunging into outer barbarism and bidden farewell to civilization for some few months. Okay, it's um, the night before I go to Robari or um, to the howling wilderness as um, AK calls it you know like 60 miles from the nearest white man and all that stuff but yeah, I only know it really through the diaries so I have no picture of it apart from through his eyes so it feels scary and risky and um, I think it's the sort of part of the trip that I most that most connects me to my own fears about deep fears about my health going and dying and um, connecting
connecting back to my heart operation. Two years before, I'd had open heart surgery and a valve replacement. I'm fully recovered except that I'm on the drug warfarin for the rest of my life, so I'm more careful with my health now and travelled with half a chemist's shop. AK had other remedies. The profuse perspiration produced by fever brings on a corresponding thirst, which must be allayed by constant drinking in small quantities. Luckily, I'd taken the precaution to bring up a case of champagne with me. AK had his last bout of serious fever and robarian. Basically had to be invalided out and the kind of, you know, there was like a two month gap in the diaries where he didn't enter anything because he was so incapable with fever. So I'm feeling a bit apprehensive. Um, I'm kind of leaving the comfort of the hotel and um, not knowing where I'm going to be tomorrow night. I'm not sure what's going to happen. Not even sure whether we're going to find it. My uncertainty came from seeing Rabari on maps from AK's time, but only being able to find a place called Bari on modern maps. We stopped to ask the way at a village to the south. What is Okay. So I need to try for a trace, you know. They told us we could reach Bari by road only from the north. It's more accessible that area than here. Here they will go halfway, then they walk on foot. There they will go right into the village itself. Where's this? This is Bari. This was the last shot I filmed for an hour or so while we negotiated with the chief about filming. Tajani told me that my arrival as a white person in the village had raised their hopes that I would be able to help them overcome the devastation of the recent rebel war. So we said I was a lone individual without aid agency resources but I agreed to talk to everyone I met afterwards about the village's needs in exchange for being able to film there. As you say, we are during the last war now, in the 90s war, the rebel war. Yeah, they destroyed everything. They destroyed everything. All this you are seeing is, everything is new, virtually. All Rabari's buildings were destroyed in the war which raged in Sierra Leone through most of the 1990s, causing 50,000 deaths and countless injuries and mutilations. The devastation is reflected in most areas of the country. In Rabari, so far, they've been able to rebuild less than a third of their houses. Mm. A week today since I shaved. Everybody grows a beard up here. Mine so far threatens to be perfectly black and a more revolting object than my own face in the glass just now I've not seen for a very long time. This isn't AK, it's Lieutenant Lendy who commanded the post at Rabari a couple of years before him, during the time of the so-called Yoni War. Rabari was the stronghold of the Yonis, a restless, warlike tribe who were the terror of all the country round. These were mostly trade wars, you know, among uh, the, the rulers. Although at that time they were wrongly called uh, tribal wars. But the wars were not between tribes. For instance, the Yoni fought their neighbors, who were also Timni. These wars were basically about trade and not uh, about ethnic groups. The perpetual internecine wars which have long prevailed in these parts have been the curse of this country, 
and rendered any development of its natural resources impossible. Coupled with this was also the period of the scramble for Africa, mm -hmm. when Europeans were clamoring to get territories. And uh, these activities, the, the wars, uh, sort of adversely affected not just the trading interests but the political interests as well. A.K. tells the story of his regiment's suppression of the Yonis two years before his posting in Rabari. He describes it as an expedition to break down the power of the Yonis and restore peace and security to the land. When I first read the diaries, I was chilled by A.K.'s celebration of imperial brutality. They'd started early in the morning. It had been like walking through a green tunnel all the time. There were still some hours of daylight and it was determined to attack at once. The six-pounder and the Maxim, the first, by the way, ever used on active service, were planted on the hill across the river and rockets and shells were poured into the town. The Yonis began swarming onto the roofs of their huts, tearing off the thatch to prevent them from being fired by the rockets. And then the Maxim was turned onto them and they dropped off the roofs by dozens. When the first soldiers entered the gate, there was not a live Yoni in the town, though no lack of stiffens. The rapidity and ease with which the dreadful Yonis were defeated spread dismay amongst the more warlike of the tribes and impressed them with the utter futility of contending with the omnipotent white man. As the Yoni War was over by AK's time in Rabari, his job was to help British travelling commissioners draw up treaties with local chiefs. They quickly dispatched these travelling commissioners, Garrett, Aldridge and others, mm. to sign more effective treaties, which they call standard treaties, with uh, mm. the local rulers, which, among other things, uh, we had to stop the wars. Uh, but more importantly, that these local rulers should not give away their territories to any foreign power. This afternoon, Aldridge arrived. He's a travelling commissioner, one of the two who go bushwhacking in this country to settle treaties and various palavers among the high chiefs. Like AK, Aldridge rode around the country carried by four native bearers in a hammock like this one, or in a two-man version. AK writes that, These men have a hard time of it whilst they're moving about, they go unaccompanied by a doctor or any other Europeans to talk to and of course have to put up with the rudest fare and lodging. Aldridge was also a keen photographer and recorded traditional ceremonial practices as he travelled. Tomorrow is the day appointed for the great palaver for which Aldridge has come up. Distinguished company are sleeping under my roof tonight. In the spare concho behind is no less a personage than Madame Yoko, the queen of all the Mendy people, who arrived yesterday. Aldridge and A.K. did manage to get a treaty signed between the various parties, despite A.K.'s impatience with his guests. Hang it all, there's Sori Kaseba beginning to snore. Both he and Mammy Yoko begged me for candles, which they apparently intended to burn all night. But having an aversion to a light when you want to sleep, I had them both put out. Following the signing of treaties, the British strategy was to appoint the strongest warriors as chiefs in order to secure their position, as the current chief of Rabari explains. Uh. The other next man, Payamba Fakla. 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 After the leech of that parliament chief, he was also elected by the British. Mm. In every section or community, mm. the strongest fighter is appointed. They, right. they pick the strongest fighter. Uh -huh. So it's like survival for the fittest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, only the strong survive. Uh, there are still British interests in Sierra Leone operating in similar ways to those in AK's day. The Yoni War and the subsequent treaty making were ultimately about waterborne trading routes and who controlled the rivers around Robari. As AK said of a battle in which his fellow soldiers slaughtered numbers of luckless natives, I suppose it was necessary in order to teach them not to meddle with British traders. In the last few years, the British government, in line with the World Bank, have been pressurising Sierra Leone to privatise its water supply, 
opening it up to UK and international companies. This in a country in which only about 30% of people have access to adequate water and sanitation. Nowadays we exert influence with market economics rather than the Maxim gun. The chief gave us a couple of chickens, a couple of live chickens, cockles, um, which uh, quite close to some of the things that, that happened to my great grandfather when he travelled around places. Incredibly hospitable, really, of these people, because like, considering how little they have, though, you know, but it's part of the tradition of hospitality so we obviously gave them some money at the end of the whole process but um, and went away with these two chickens okay 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 thank you yeah. 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 Friday, January the 2nd, 1891. Nothing like prefixing a title page to the beginning of a new year. When next year opens, I hope to have said farewell forever to the west coast of Africa. That is, if I get out of it alive. In fact, AK only lasted another month before his next and final bout of fever. I feel pretty horrible this morning. I just... Uh, um, strange dream about um, for some reason I was looking after a cage of alligators, a cage of doors open and um, I had to kind of um, run towards the door and close it before this great lumbering alligator kind of um, ran towards the door, sort of lumbered towards the, the door. But it was just very frightening. I think I expected after my operation, because I kind of nearly died, I expected somehow that I wouldn't that that I wouldn't be afraid anymore. <laughs> It's New Year's Day at about nine o'clock in the evening and after the fall that I took on the way to um, Bobo Beach to film the dancing, I am now completely laid up with a sprained leg, which is really, really painful. I don't think I've ever experienced such muscle pain in my life. <laughs> John, who took us there to Bobo, uh, knew people there and knew the head man there and talked to the head man and um, cleared it with him that it was okay for me to film some of the dancing, which was this kind of ceremony, ceremonial dance they put on every year on New Year's day to kind of get rid of the old year.
I filmed the dance for an hour or so. I was feeling bruised and distracted from my fall, but I'd wanted to record a dance to set against this passage in AK's diary. I saw a strange sight yesterday afternoon on the way down to bathe at Tower Hill. A great crowd of niggers and savages collected in the road which the path from here crosses. About halfway down, three Johnnies sat on one side beating tom-toms and the other people hummed a weird monotonous chant in time to them, whilst in the middle of the road three grotesque figures wrapped from head to foot in exceedingly dirty coloured rags, sometimes capered up and down and executed a rude sort of dance step, and sometimes rolled about in the thick red dust and performed strange antics, occasionally indecent. The dust they kicked up, trailing their dresses in the road and rolling about, was unbearable. Added to the horrible row of tom-toms beating, the women clapping, babies squalling with alarm, and everybody shouting their deadly old song. In the middle of me filming the, the drummers, um, this guy uh, who was really drunk, I think, kind of stopped me filming and then all hell broke loose. There was a kind of a, a fight between um, him and the head man and lots of shouting and a few fists flying and um, a lot of bad feeling. Back at the hotel, I spent some time filming vultures, what AK calls Abominable great Johnny Crows. They're the most daring brutes, partly, I suppose, because nobody shoots them, repulsive looking creatures. I was feeling more and more pain in my hip where I'd fallen, and when I finished dinner, I couldn't get up from the table without help. The doctor I saw the next day thought I'd just got a tiny hairline fracture in my pelvis, gave me some crutches, and said the pain would go in a few days. The next afternoon, as I filmed myself practicing on the crutches in my room, the electricity supply in Freetown was worse than usual. It was cut off and put back on half a dozen times. Each time a CD player repeatedly turned itself on in the next door room, blasting out. One day One day at a time, sweet Jesus. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. The following day, the pain was much worse and I fainted on the floor. I was very scared but managed to contact another doctor, Olabisi Cole, who worked out that I'd had a massive internal hemorrhage because of the warfarin I was taking. I lay in bed filming this owl and imagining it asking me what I thought I was doing in this weird room in Freetown, ill and frightened, far from my friends and family, and looking for something Africa probably couldn't give me. Dr Cole liaised with my insurance company and my partner Jane to get me flown back to the UK after checking me into a Freetown hospital. So uh, this is me in my hospital bed at the Netlands Hospital in Freetown, uh, getting ready to go home and I'm getting kind of medivaced out and repatriated. This is a very odd picture, right high up on the wall, that seems to be people skating, not in Africa. AK too was medevaced home to this vicarage in Hampshire after his sixth bout of fever. This is where he finished his Sierra Leone story in the diaries. I'm only thankful I came down from Rabari when I did. If I hadn't, might possibly never have come down at all. As it was, I suppose I should consider myself lucky to have got home all right. I'm, um... I'm going home tomorrow, which is a big fucking relief. I've, um... Uh, 
<laughs> I'm completely wasted, basically. My air ambulance came from Frankfurt, piloted by a Captain Hatzel. He sent me these photos he'd taken as I lay on the stretcher. I'd been flown from Freetown to the airport in a helicopter, and his medical colleagues started treating me there, with Dr Cole looking on. On the plane they gave me massive blood transfusions because my haemoglobin count was dangerously low. The flight home took about eight hours, a fraction of the 11 days or so of AK's sea voyage. Just after passing the Canaries, his dog took ill and was put down, which he described as a night of real sorrow. Poor Jemmy, the merriest, most cheerful, companionable and altogether best beloved dog I ever had, came to his melancholy end. It always makes me choke now to think of it. After having been with me everywhere up in the bush and shared my adventures there, to be miserably thrown overboard at sea within a week of home. I got home alive thanks to the transfusions. My flight probably cost my insurance company more than a thousand times of what poorer people in Sierra Leone have to live on in a year. But I didn't think about that when Jane and my daughter Zosha visited that night in the hospital. I felt like I'd returned from exile and laughed with the joy of seeing them. I don't believe in autobiographies from the days of my mother, my grandmother and my mother. They would refer to autobiographies as uh, people wanting to. They have to because nobody knows they exist. <laughs> That's why you write autobiographies. So, uh, well, that's proof you exist. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs>